So today we're gonna to be talking about book three in Malazan, Book of the Fallen, Memories of Ice. I am gonna start off this video just by being really transparent with you, and that's that I, the Malazan books are the most intimidating and challenging books to review because they are so dense, there's so much happening, so many characters, and I just know I'm gonna get some stuff wrong, and I just, I wanna do the books justice, but I just have to accept that I'm not going to and do my best. I'm gonna start off this review by talking about some general things that I just love about this book, about these books, um, just talking about it very generally, which will be a little bit repetitive if you follow my channel closely and you've been watching my vlogs and stuff, so you can skip that if you feel like it. I'll have timestamps, and then after we talk about general, generally talking about this book in spoilers, this is a spoiler-filled review, um, then we'll get into some specific scenes that just really hit me, some specific things that I really wanna talk about a little bit. So starting with the general stuff, I just, I just, I'm amazed as I read Erickson's work, um, I'm amazed at his ability to write every scene, uh, every emotion, whether someone's going through, having the most thrilling, exciting uh, experience of their life, whether they're going through loss and tragedy and pain and a breakdown when they're completely changing from who they once were to who they are now, fighting fate, um, even just writing, really devastating, terrible, sickening scenes. His ability to convey every emotion that he wants to honestly just blows me away. I said this in a recent video. I'm not a writer and there's no reason for me to, to feel this way, but I do. I feel like I wanna study Erickson's books because the way he's able to, every scene he wants to write, every emotion he wants to convey, convey the way that he just does it is like a masterclass to me. I'm just, I'm blown away. Lines like, among the dead beneath me, how many adult voices cried out for their mothers? Death and dying makes us into children once again. In truth, one last time, there in our final wailing cries, more than one philosopher has claimed that we ever remain children, far beneath the indurated layers and make up the armor of adulthood. Oh my goodness, uh, parents struggle. Nonsense, Tatter. Silver Fox. Not me. You are wrong. You must be. I am not. My hand was guided in the fashioning of the card that is you. What card? She did not answer. Continued as if she had not heard him. This one, which I've quoted twice already in other videos, but it just, it's too much. And so you would die now, the crown said. Yes, I understand. A mother must not be led to hate the child she has birthed. Yet you demand too much of yourself. She has stolen my life, the Mybe screamed, gnarled hands closing to fists from which the blood within them fled. The Rivy woman stared at those fists, eyes wide as if they were seeing a stranger's hands, skeletal and dead, there at the end of her thin arms. Oh, crone, she cried softly. She has stolen my life. The way he conveys the, the, the struggles that these characters are going through, through dialogue, through physical cues, just through this ability to just bring their hearts right to the surface, it's incredible. The way he describes the things that are happening, but as well as the what it takes from these people, what they're experiencing, what it costs them. There's, there's consequences to everything. There's, there's no one that walks out of anything unscathed. There's nobody that, that has an incredible thing or a horrible thing happen to them that just moves on. Everybody is affected. Everybody is changed. Everybody is just going through it, man. The scenes of action are so thrilling. The scenes of pain are so devastating. The just. Even dialogue, the action is written so well, but then even just sitting around a table talking is so gripping. The way he writes dialogue, the way he sprinkles humor into things or, or um, the back and forth, the intensity of what they have to say to each other, the friendships that he writes. I'm just constantly amazed by his ability to do everything, almost everything that I read, I'm just like, that scene was perfect. This book was extremely dense. There was a lot of information. There were tons of reveals and I tracked with some of them. Um, I'm gonna do my best to talk about some of it. There were 
Times where reading this book was both emotionally and mentally exhausting, but it was also one of the most rewarding books that I have read, and I just really, really enjoy it. I really, really loved that this book was uh, was so closely inspecting the things that have happened in the past, things that happened hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago that are affecting present day right now. I really, really loved um, learning more about the history of this world, and it only made me want to learn more more. I'm desperate to learn more about how this world was created, about how certain things came together, and we got a lot of that throughout this book. We got a lot of information about the history, about things that are that are forever old, and I just want more of it. Um, I also really love the 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 discussion in the story about fighting fate about how people are destined to continue in a certain direction yet it seems like the individuals are able to change the course of fate individuals who are are who have are fated to be a certain way they do get to make those decisions you have people like Perrin who's fighting fate and can't seem to succeed fighting it you have people like um talk who just didn't really seem to have a good option. <laughs> and there are times where I feel like, did you have, is, was there a chance for you in fate? And then there are others where it seems like they don't have a choice, yet they do. They do make specific decisions that can change the course of everything. And it's just, I'm just really, it was really good. Um, sorry, I said I was going to get into specifics and not talk about generals. So specifics. Talk is alive. <laughs> already said something about him. Todd the Younger is alive. I didn't think he would stay dead. That's the thing with Malazan is that death is different here. Resurrection is a common theme, which is one of my least favorite tropes in the world. Hate resurrection, hate fake out deaths. But I really love the way it's done in this world because it's not just, I killed a character to get an emotional scene out of you, to get you to cry, but I take it back because I still want to use that character for things. Like, no, get out of here. Go away for Forever. It's hate it. And some of some of my most read authors, some of my favorite series, overuse resurrection and fake out deaths, and it just point of contention for me. But in Malazan, it's totally different because returning from death is not a simple thing. It's not an easy thing. It's not something that you are just like, well, I'm here again. Let's keep fighting. No, it's like it changes you and the consequences are strong. Speaking, speaking of all that, Silver Fox is a major player in this book and oh my goodness, I was so excited when she was introduced on the page and she's described as um, having two souls, she's Tattersail and Night Chill. Am I remembering? the name correctly. I'm very, very bad with names and there are so many characters to keep track of in this series. I'm pretty sure it's Silver Fox and Night Chill. They, they're um, of two souls, which we've seen before in, I think her name was Siri from book two, but she has a new name now that starts with an A. Ugh. Anyway, she's of two souls, but maybe there's more to, maybe there's more going on there. I'm so excited. Tattersail and Nightchill are some of my favorite characters from book one, but especially Tattersail. And it seems like Tattersail is the main soul that's kind of driving Silver Fox, but I still just have so many questions about Silver Fox and how much, like what's the ratio? Can we get a percentage of how much of each soul is is in control? How much are they blending together? I really wish, I really wish we got some perspectives of Silver Fox so that we could see what's going on inside of her. Are the souls warring? Are they arguing? Are they in accord? Are they in agreement? Have they blended together to the point that now they have their own personality that is of the two of them? I just, I have so many questions, but I just, I loved Silver Fox's character. And just also the added fact that Silver Fox is very, um, the way she grows, the way she gains power, the way she ages and matures so quickly is by depleting the life of her mother. That is some dark stuff. And the My Bee struggle was something that I just, I kept coming back to when I was talking about this in the reading vlogs, which if you don't know, I have reading vlogs where I talk, I like give weekly updates as I'm reading things. And the My Bee struggle was something that I kept coming back to because her 
desire to serve her daughter and and to want to to say like this is just my fate and of course I want to take care of her and going from that to I can't hate my daughter but I'm really struggling right now and her deterioration her unraveling as she's losing her life as she's as her life is being sucked away from her and then being tormented uh, with these dreams in one scene she's having the most thrilling dream of riding a dragon and then the next which was an awesome scene and I loved it so much and then the next scene she's being hunted by wolves and and running for her life and 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 then you have the connection with um Kroppa, that he can actually see her dreams, he can see through and he can like see what's happening. I just, there's so, there's so much that's around this whole thing. And it's just basically everything in this world. If you examine it just a little bit, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't, I don't want to live here because the horrors that are in these people's lives that are just kind of thrown on them. Oh, also, also Tattersail's destiny is she is meant to lead the Talani Mass. Is that, let me just look up the quote really fast. I want to make sure that I'm saying it correctly. My future, she whispered after a moment, her arms drawing around herself, belongs to the Talani Mass. She spun sil silent, suddenly. They are gathering and you will need their power in the war to come. Oh my gosh. Silver Fox is a character that I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes the decisions she made were, uh, I felt like I could track with her. I felt like I could understand. And sometimes she seemed so cold. Sometimes the decisions she made, the, 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 the things that she decided, I was just like, first of all, I don't understand why you won't give the wolves the opportunity to, uh, how do I word this? She won't let the wolves go with the wolf clan. And I just didn't understand that decision. I didn't understand why she she did, why she made that choice or, or why she didn't communicate more. I feel like we could have avoided so much if she would have just said some words. I don't know, but she's one of the most fascinating characters. I, depending on the scene, I either love her or hate her, but my general feeling toward her is, oh my goodness, this is the most fascinating character. Perrin was deteriorating in this book and I just, I felt so bad for him, you know, from book one where he was so strong and, and capable and excited to take on what challenges he had to now where he is, fighting fate so much. He doesn't want to ascend. He doesn't want to be the master of the deck of dragons. And um, I just feel like from book one to book two, that's a big, the big thing that I really enjoyed about this book is that there's been a space of time where I've not been with these characters. While I was in book two, they were growing and changing. And when I'm reintroduced to them and when I'm seeing them again, they've changed so much. And um, a lot of it is the the wearing down of war, the wearing down of what they've had to go through has changed them in just this very painful way. Um, Adam Andrew Reich is obviously still one of my favorites. The way people react to him when he walks into a room that they're like, all right, everybody get in order because he's here. The conversations that he has, his relationship with Whiskey Jack, that friendship. Oh man, there's so many fantastic friendships in these stories, amazing pairings, duos that I'm just like, I eat up their interactions. And there wasn't a lot between Adam and Eric and Whiskey Jack, but every scene we got with those two, I just, I ate up. They were some of my favorite scenes. Uh, we get the revelation that the crippled god is wanting to get free. He's causing chaos in the Warrens and he's gonna go ahead and kill Burns. So just a lot, a lot of reveals happening. A lot of reveals that happen through dialogue that's like normally I would be opposed to, but the way it's done, it's just so gripping um, despite it being completely void of action. I love the dynamics that we got between Do Talk and the Dire Wolf and Tool and Lady Envy. Uh, there were, the, remember the scene when Lady Envy brings him into the temple and she just so casually, and the monk so casually is like, we got some more people in and she takes him into the room where we see the people hanging from the walls and like the walls are dripping with blood and urine and it's like oh. terrible scene 
and how the way that she talks or shows this stuff and talks about her plans and responds to him in this very dry, unfeeling way, she's terrifying. Um, I really like the dynamic between all of them though. <laughs> Till Talk decides to leave, and then his whole plot line just takes a real big turn. And I understand that he feels that if he stays with Lady Envy, he's probably going to die. So this really just feels like the only option for him. Not to mention that he used to be a spy. So he figures he can infiltrate the army without being found out. And he wants to he wants to get back to the Malazan Empire. So he feels like this army is, a, is gonna get him there. So like I, I see the pieces of why he made this choice and I do understand why he would, I get it, but at the same time, the choices that he did make led him to some of the most gruesome, horrifying scenes I've ever read. Oh, we're also introduced to the Children of the Dead Seed, which frankly I just don't even want to talk about. Um, one reason why it takes me so long to get through these books and why after I finish one, I need to take a long break before I get to the next is because I love dark worlds. I love very stark, raw examinations of humanity and of the consequences of war and like everything that Erickson does is like, it's right up my alley. However, <laughs> frequent and graphic descriptions of sexual assaults and of abuse towards children or brutality towards children. These are things that are just extremely difficult for me to read. And these are common themes within these books. So I just struggle to get through certain parts of these books. And I just don't wanna talk about parts of them. So I won't. Oh, we also get the backstory of the bridge burners and then we find out that two of the founding races are now the undead. There's just, like I said, there's just, there's so many, oh man, it's so hard for me to feel like I can sit down and discuss because I feel like either rapid fire mention things or be here for hours. And I can't be here for hours because it's my daughter's birthday, I need to go hang with her. But so many little revelations and scenes that, that it just, I feel like every, around every corner, there were exciting things happening. Oh, speaking of Whiskey Jack, I talked about him with Adamander Rake, um, but just him alone too. I love him in this book. The revelation that he could have been an, an amazing ruler if he had just stepped up and taken the power, but he refused to do it. Like, <sighs> I love his character. I just love hanging out with him. But the more I learn about him, the more I'm just like amazed at at who he is, at what he's capable of. Uh, um, according to my notes, it's time to talk about the siege of Capistan. Um, if I'm saying that correctly, the the flood of bodies, the sea of bodies. Um, this one was intense to read. Uh, Gruntle fighting his way to the top, the way it was described, uh, bodies up to his chest. I, the, the pain and the terror of this scene, I had to take a break <laughs> after reading it. I think Joe Abercrombie is an author that I oftentimes, I feel like the really close battle scenes is something that he thrives at, but I think Erickson, is one of the best writers that I've ever read of for epic battles, things that are so wide, that there's so much happening, and that he can balance all that and still bring us in really, really close. Um, it's really incredible. And it's really, I guess the battle itself was incredible and terrible to read, but it was the aftermath that I think that hit me even harder with Whiskey, Whiskey Jack, with the bridge burners, uh, talk being reborn into one of the children of the Dead Seed's bodies. Oh, and Duker telling the remaining bridge burners of the chain of dogs. The betrayal, the last stand, the more I think about it, <laughs> the more I think about it, the more there is. What was that line? I am the shield anvil and I am not done yet. Behold, I yield to nothing. The aftermath of this siege was probably more impactful than the siege itself for me. My daughter just walked in, she needs me. So I will return and finish talking about this Mommy. later. Daddy. Welcome. 
I uh, wasn't able to get back to the video the other day when I was filming it, so new day, new me. Let's finish talking about Memories of Ice. I left off at the siege. I'm pretty sure I finished talking about that. So just moving into the final section of this video, talking about the final sections of the book that really, really stood out to me. One of which being when Adamander Rake uh, went to kill the women of the Dead Seed. That scene, I mentioned it briefly in the vlog. I read a little ex excerpt in it. That scene was incredible to me because the way um, the way the action is written anytime we get scenes with Adamander Rake specifically is always top tier. Uh, I think that Erickson's action scenes are incredible. And so reading about him in his dragon form and reading about him going to attack them and everything that happens uh, in <laughs> that devastating haunting scene was so well written. It was so thrilling yet devastating. Um, when Adamander Rake uh, went to use his sword to, what is it? it, like it sucks them in and traps them in there. When he went to use his sword on them and Whiskey, Whiskey Jack felt like that fate was too, uh, too cruel, which I don't know that I agree. And he went, to, and he, he decided to finish the executions for him that just the whole sequence was incredible. Also, another scene of dialogue that I felt was nearly just as thrilling and exciting and overwhelming as uh, as the scenes of action is the scene where, uh, who was it, Perrin and Talk decided to legitimize the House of Chains in the Deck of Dragons so that uh, they could essentially make the crippled god play by their rules. I loved that scene of dialogue. I loved the back and forth. I loved the tenacity of these characters. And to me, that setup is, I'm so excited to watch that play out more and what the consequences of that are going to be moving forward. And of course, the scene that probably stands out to me the most, I mean, other than the siege, the siege was just, it, was incredible. And and the scene with Adamanda Rake attacking the the women of the Dead Seed, incredible. There's you know there's a lot of amazing scenes, but the scene that really really affected me was of course Whiskey Jack's death. I don't know, this is a series where legitimately anybody can die. I read a lot of series where it feels like the stakes are high, but then things get undone so much where I guess I read a lot of series where either the stakes feel really high, but nobody actually dies, or at least nobody of consequence, nobody really significant jo dies, just those side characters that I kind of cared about, or a lot of series where uh, the stakes feel high, somebody dies, and then like, you know, resurrection, fake outs, all that nonsense, I hate. And with this series, the stakes are legitimately high. It's actually truly genuinely high. And characters like Whiskey Jack, who I am so, I care about so much, I'm so invested in, I've spent so much time watching him move and being in his life. And I care about this character. I genuinely care about him. I care about his friendships. I care about the progression of his character arc. And now he's gone. And this is a series where resurrection is a major component, but it's different from most series that I read, where the resurrection actually genuinely has consequences. There's real, um, there's real payment that you have to give to come back. And I don't know what it's going to look like for him. I don't know if he is coming back. I expect he will. I don't think this is the last that we've seen of him, but whenever we see him again, he'll be different. And that is enough to make me mourn him right now because I'm sad. But that scene where, let me see if I can just pull it up. Every line and edge of what she saw too sharp, sharp like knife blades slicing her soul to ribbons. Kalor with a delighted roar charging towards Silver Fox. Chain armor flowing like a cloak, gray veined magic danced on the ground around the warrior. The rivy woman stopped, mouth opening, terror filling her eyes. She screamed something, something. Talani, defend me. Yet she remained alone. Kalor closed, sword gripped in both gauntleted hands, closed, raising the weapon high. Then Whiskey Jack stood in his path. Long sword lashed up to clang against Kalor's weapon. 
A sudden, fierce exchange, sparks flashing, Kalor leapt back, bellowing his frustration and his heel caught. Whiskey Jack saw his moment, sword thrusting out, a duelist lunge, fully extending, weight pounding down on the, on the lead leg, which buckled. She saw the silver of bone rip up through the man's leather-clad thigh, saw the pain on her lover's face, the sudden recognition as Kalor's huge sword plunged into his chest, slid between ribs, ripped through heart and lungs in a diagonal inward slicing thrust. Whiskey Jack died on that blade, life dropping back from the eyes that met Kalorad's back away, then gone. Kalor dragged his weapon free. I don't know. 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 I think we're gonna see him again. I hope we see him again in some capacity, but at the same time, his freaking leg, of course it's his freaking leg. Why didn't he, why didn't he take the time to get it fixed, to get it healed? Why was he in this moment with this weak weakness? The fact that he died defending Silver Fox, Dadgummit, you know? Just dadgummit. I don't know. This one hurt. This one hurt real bad. I mean, I think that Erickson can write near every scene and a death scene is not, is not, it's on the list. A death scene is on the list of what he can write so well and so effectively. And I don't know. This one hurt. There's a lot of other things that happened here at the end. Um, Lady Envy helped Adamander Ray kill her father. I don't really know what's going on with Talk, honestly. He has the soul of Tool with him in the body of a child of the Dead Sea. I have no idea where his plot line is going. I have no idea what we're supposed to do with him in future books. Like, he's a character. I feel like, I feel like most of these characters, I, I can't always predict what they'll do, and a lot of times they surprise me, but I feel like I understand them and I understand their motivations, and Talk is a character that I really just feel like I can't quite get a grasp of, can't get a hold of, and so I just genuinely have no idea what to anticipate from his character in the future. Oh, speaking of understanding people's motivations and totally, like, I can track with the things that people do. Ekovian took all the pain for the Talani Mass and then died never would have called that one, ever. Duker is alive, which is, I, I don't know. I don't know, there, a lot, a lot happened there at the end, a lot I didn't anticipate, a lot of emotions, frankly overwhelming. This is a very, I don't know, this book, I feel like so much of the last three books have come together and have, it's been, it's been a very fulfilling book to read. It's been a very overwhelming book, a very dense book, uh, a lot of moving parts to keep track of, a lot of characters to keep track of, characters that are constantly changing both in personality and in motivations and in decisions, like characters that I feel like I understood are constantly evolving and I have to relearn them as well as just physically they're changing. Like their souls are combining with other characters. They're in new bodies. They're gaining new names. Like things are constantly changing in this story and there's so much to keep track of. And while I am the type of reader that I love to underline things, I love to, uh, you know, highlight texts and keep them and store them on my phone. You know, like I love to engage with the text that way. I'm not a rigorous note taker, so it's just a lot to keep track of. But at the same time, I feel like this book has kind of just changed the way I see Malazan in a lot of ways. And it is definitely of the three, the most fulfilling book, the most, the, the greatest payoff where things are really coming together. And I feel like I'm starting to see a clear direction for the series. And I'm sure that I'm wrong on everything that I think, <laughs> but um, I don't know. It has me really excited to keep reading. I'm still, I like, I'm not diving into book four immediately. I still need a break between these stories because they're so emotionally and mentally taxing, but you know, primarily emotionally taxing that I just, I just need 
a little bit of a break before I get to the next one, but I will for sure be starting book four uh, this year in the second half of the year and finishing it this year before the year's done. And um, I don't know, I just, I love them. <laughs> I love them. I don't feel qualified to actually be sitting down and discussing them. I think that you gotta read the series through a couple of times to be able to do that, but this is my very pitiful attempt at trying. Feel free to continue chatting with me about it in the comments if you feel like, correct the stuff that I've messed up, explain the stuff that I missed and, and misunderstood or you know, couldn't get my head around, please. I love that. And um, I will, I will absolutely be continuing on with the series, so. We will chat about it more in the future. Feel free to subscribe if you want to continue on with my with my progress reading through these books. I do weekly reading vlogs where I give updates and I will be doing that with book four as well whenever I do pick it up. There will be reviews. Uh, I post videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the other channel, Tuesdays and Thursdays on this one. I'll see you again soon. Bye.